Until the 5th and early 4th century BC, Macedonia was a small, often ignored state in northern Greece, unlike major powers like Athens, Sparta, or Thebes. It was even seen as barbaric, but when Philip II became king in 359 BC, he transformed Macedonia. With a strong economy and a welcoming capital, Pella, he expanded Macedonia's influence through war and diplomacy, controlling both northern and central Greece. But soon, after defeating the Athens, Thebes coalition at the decisive Battle of Chaeronea in 338 BC, Philip officially gained hegemony over Greece. Macedon was now strong enough, and Philip decided to conquer Persia, the largest empire back then, and funded Greek factions to oppose Philip. However, before being able to launch the invasion, he was assassinated. This threw Macedonia into chaos, with rebellions and enemies rising against them. At just 20 years old, Alexander the Great, Philip's son, took the throne. His enemies thought they could crush him quickly, but Alexander acted fast. He eliminated his father's killers and launched a campaign across Greece, crushing rebellions, especially the Theban uprising. With this victory, many Greek cities, including Athens and Sparta, submitted to him. After securing peace in Greece in 336 BC, Alexander continued the intention of invade Persia of his father with reason to lead the allied Greeks in a war of liberation, to free forever from Persian control the Greek cities along the Anatolian coast and on the island of Cyprus that were subject to local despots, called tyrants, who were loyal to the Persian king from 547 BC, and in so doing also, to exact revenge for the Persians' invasion of Greece under great King Xerxes in 480 to 479 BCE, during which famous battles like Thermopylae, Salamis, and Plataea took place. If you're interested in these epic battles, please check our channel to take a look at it. By spring 334 BC, he led an army of 30,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry into Asia Minor, quickly winning a major victory at the Granicus River defeating 40,000 Persian troops. Then, he crushed Darius III, king of Persia at the Battle of Issus one year later, forcing the king to flee, leaving behind his family. Alexander then continued south, capturing Tyre after a seven-month siege and marching into Egypt. By 332 BC, Alexander had conquered Asia Minor, Egypt, and much of the Mediterranean. While Alexander the Great was busy continuing his conquest, Darius retreated to Babylon after the complete defeat in Battle of Issus to rebuild a large and powerful army, aiming to take revenge. Beside that, he also attempted to halt Alexander's colonial invasion through diplomatic means. He tried to negotiate peace with Alexander three times, each offer more generous than the last, even offering co-rulership of his empire. But that was not what Alexander wanted. There can only be one king of Asia, he declared. And now, Darius understood that it's time for the decisive battle to decide who would be the sole king of Asia, and the king of Macedon decided that it's time for the Babylon conquest. Therefore, in the summer of 331 BC, after leaving Egypt, he made his way toward the Tigris River. By July or August, he arrived at Thapsacus, near the Euphrates River. The Persian general Mazaeus had been tasked with guarding the river crossing, but upon seeing Alexander's advancing forces, he retreated without a fight. Macedon's army then crossed the Euphrates using pontoon bridges they had built. Instead of taking the direct, more dangerous route through the desert to Babylon, Alexander wisely chose to head north. This path avoided the brutal desert heat of 50 degrees Celsius and had rural settlements that provide easier access to food and water than the cities near the river that were well defended. Alexander arrived at the Tigris in late September. On the night after Alexander's army crossed the Tigris, a blood-red lunar eclipse appeared, causing fear among the Persian troops. To the Babylonians, this was a bad omen, signaling the downfall of Persia. The Chaldean priests, skilled in interpreting such signs, predicted that this eclipse, combined with the appearance of Saturn and a westerly wind, meant destruction would come from the west, which made Darius's men watch in eerie silence, because it was the direction where Alexander's forces were advancing. So. Darius knew things were about to get real, and he needed a solid spot for the big battle. He picked a vast plain on the left side of the Tigris River. To the south of the plain was Arbala, and close to it was the small village of Gaugamela. This location was strategic, because if the Greeks were pushed back, 
they would be trapped by the two large rivers behind them, making escape difficult. Meanwhile, Alexander's troops, being the sneaky pros they were, caught some Persian scouts who spilled the beans. Darius was camping just 30 kilometers to the east. Not wasting any time, Alexander sent out his own scouts and started heading toward the enemy. Alexander set up camp behind a hill, about 10 kilometers away from the Persian forces. After a few days of rest and preparation, he decided it was time to take action. The hill was guarded by Mazias with a significant force. You'd expect a confrontation, but instead, Mazias took one look at Alexander's approaching army and chose not to engage. Without a fight, he retreated, allowing Alexander to take control of the hill. This move gave Alexander a significant tactical advantage, as the high ground allowed him to observe Darius's camp. He paid special attention to the traces of newly dug battlefields, which he judged to be traps and pitfalls of the enemy. As night fell, Alexander gathered his commanders to discuss their next move. Parmenian, his trusted second-in-command, suggested a surprise night attack, hoping to catch the Persians off guard. But Alexander refused. He stated that he would not demean victory by stealing victory like a thief. Alexander must defeat his enemies openly and honestly. He thought it was too risky and decided to wait until morning. While Alexander's Macedonian troops were catching some well-deserved sleep, prepping for the big battle ahead, Darius's army wasn't so lucky. You see, they didn't have any fortified camp to hunker down in, so they spent the whole night in full battle gear, just waiting for Alexander to pounce. But it did not happen till the time morning rolls around. Those Persian warriors are not just tired, they're demoralized. Their fighting spirit drained before the battle even begins. Meanwhile, October 1st was coming. When Alexander woke up from his nap, he and his army moved into battle formation on the Gaugamela Plain, ready to face the Persian army once again. This time though, the battle wasn't going to be easy. Darius's army was enormous, stretching far beyond Alexander's flanks, and almost guaranteeing they could outflank the Macedonians. The Persian forces were organized into three main sections, the left flank, the right flank, and the center, and deployed a rectangular, three-line horizontal formation that was disproportionate to vertical. The left army was commanded by Bessus, General Mazaeus led the right one. Both wings were dense blocks of infantry and cavalry from the tribes living in the north and east of the empire. The center was led by Darius himself and included his personal cavalry, elite troops known as the Immortals, Indian cavalry, and both Persian and Greek mercenaries. Unique to the Persian center were 200 scythed chariots. 100, but of which were concentrated on the left wing and 15 war elephants. He believed that with their ferocity and formidable strength, these beasts would be a terrible threat to the enemy. In total, Darius's army was massive, with between 100,000 and 150,000 soldiers including 30,000 to 40,000 cavalry. Facing them was Alexander's much smaller force of around 40,000 infantry and 7,000 cavalry. Alexander the Great noticed that the Persian army was large and spread out, so he decided to use his favorite tactic, the oblique order. It was a tactic first invented by the famous general Epaminondas of Thebes. In contrast to the Greeks' previous strategy of spreading out their forces and attacking horizontally, Epaminondas devised a two-wing strategy. One specialized in attacking with a densely packed army and consisting of the strongest shock troops, and one specialized in defending with just enough forces to hold the enemy back. Philip II learned this tactic during his three years as a hostage in Thebes. After returning to his country, he applied it creatively and successfully in his battles, defeating the very Thebans who invented it. From then on, the oblique order became the signature tactic of the Philippos family of Macedonia. Alexander the Great himself would command elite companion cavalry on the right wing, supported by archers, hypaspists, and agrianes, to undertake the main task of the attack. The old general Parmenian, as usual, would command the left wing with allied Thessalian cavalry to defend. The Macedonian phalanx, organized into six groups, stood in the center, a position almost always reserved for them, each fully equipped. Swords, shields, leather armor padded with iron plates, but their main weapon was the heavy Sarissa spear, up to seven meters long. The warriors stand close together, about two people in one meter. In attack, each row is one meter apart. In defense, 
Each row is 0.5 meters apart. Infantry equipment includes spears, javelins, swords, shields. Heavy infantry has iron armor. When attacking or defending, the whole block advances or retreats evenly, maintaining the prescribed distance. The strength of this formation is in the front, and it has high fighting power when fighting against poorly organized opponents with weak forces. Facing a larger enemy, fighting in a strong position, Alexander the Great anticipated the possibility of being flanked, or even surrounded. Therefore, behind the main line, he arranged a second line so that in normal times, they could continue to advance and fight or reinforce the front, but when necessary, they could immediately turn back to deal with it. Macedon King soon realized the Greek formation was much shorter than the Persian line. If he charged straight, his forces would miss the enemy's left flank and crash into the center of the Persian army, right where Darius had stacked his strongest forces. Seeing the danger, Alexander made an order to shift his men to the right, avoiding a potential trap and staying on course to hit the Persian left wing. This unexpected move threw Darius off his game. Alexander was dodging the area Darius had carefully prepared for a chariot attack, leaving the Persian king scrambling to keep up. Alexander pulled off a bold tactic rarely seen in battle. He lured the Persian cavalry toward the flanks, opening up a gap in the Persian center. Exactly what Alexander had been aiming for. The key was getting the Persians to make the first move. Even though Darius had learned to be more cautious after his defeat at Issus, Alexander managed to provoke him. Darius took the bait, ordering Bessus to charge at the Greek right flank. But Alexander had a surprise in store. His light cavalry was ready and met the Persians head on, sparking a fierce clash. On the other Persian flank, Mazaeus launched an overwhelming cavalry assault against the ever stalwart Parmenian, who was, as always, desperately outnumbered. Next came the Persian chariots, blades spinning and dust flying as they charged toward the Macedonian lines. But Alexander's men were more than prepared. His archers and javelin throwers unleashed a barrage of arrows and spears, while the infantry pulled off a smart move. They opened up their ranks, creating paths for the chariots to run through, then closed in and wiped them out.
The chariot attack, which Darius had counted on, fell flat, leaving the Persians without one of their key advantages. Despite these setbacks, the Persian army was still in the fight. Realizing his left wing was crumbling under pressure from Alexander's right, Darius sent in more cavalry to try and outflank Alexander. But in doing so, he left a gaping hole in the middle of his left wing, a mistake Alexander had been waiting for. Alexander didn't waste a second. He quickly ordered his right wing into a deep spearhead formation. Leading from the front, Alexander charged straight into the gap, aiming to hit the Persian center's flank. Four of the six phalanx groups also advanced, adding to the attack. The Persians struggled under the intense pressure. The phalanx's long spears were packed tightly like a moving wall, piercing through the Persian lines and breaking up their formation. Meanwhile, from the flanks, the Macedonian cavalry charged in, their swords slashing at the Persians. Faced with this fierce assault, Darius III panicked. When he saw Alexander cutting through his guards and charging forward, the Persian king lost his nerve and fled. His sudden retreat was a disaster. He abandoned his army at a crucial moment when the battle wasn't lost yet. On the Persian right wing, things were looking better. General Mazaeus had nearly surrounded the Greek left wing under Parmenian's command, and some Persian cavalry had broken through the Greek lines. But instead of attacking the Greeks from behind, they rushed into the Greek camp to plunder. This lucky break saved Parmenian from a rear attack, but he was still in trouble and sent an urgent request for help from Alexander. Despite this, Parmenian fought hard, holding off many attacks and gradually stabilizing the situation. Meanwhile, chaos spread through the Persian army when they heard their king had fled. Parmenion seized the moment and launched a counterattack, forcing the Persian forces under Mazaeus to flee, including those looting the camp. As they retreated, they ran into Alexander's army which was on its way to help Parmenion. A fierce battle followed, with the Persians fighting desperately. Some managed to escape, but Alexander and his cavalry chased after them, riding hard all day. When they reached Arbella, they found Darius III's supplies but not the king himself. He had already fled to Media with the remains of his army. Realizing he couldn't catch up, Alexander stopped the chase and turned his focus toward capturing Babylon. The battle was a massacre and the Persians bore the brunt of it. The chaos didn't end on the battlefield. It got even worse during the retreat. As they scrambled to escape, they had to cross a narrow bridge over a small river. In the panic, many were shoved into the rushing water and drowned. The final toll was staggering. Around 40,000 Persians lost their lives, according to historian Rufus. For the Greeks, it was a far lighter toll they lost only a few hundred men. The contrast between the two sides couldn't have been more striking. While the Persians faced a disastrous defeat and tremendous losses, the Greeks emerged victorious with relatively few casualties. After the Battle of Gaugamela, the Greek coalition faced a grueling three-year struggle to fully subdue the vast Persian Empire. Yet, for King Darius III, the battle was not just a defeat. It was the cataclysmic end of his reign. And the irreversible downfall of the Achaemenid dynasty. Darius's defeat shattered his spirit and left him powerless to challenge Alexander further. His life ended in betrayal and murder at the hands of Bessus. In the wake of this monumental loss, the Persian armies retreated into their own territories and the defenders of the Persian capital surrendered without resistance. The famed Persian general Mazaeus 
along with his treasurer Bagaphanes, surrendered at Babylon. Alexander's grand entrance into the ancient city was a symbol of his overwhelming triumph. Bessus was hunted down and met a grim fate, being torn apart a year later. With the majority of Persian satraps pledging allegiance to Alexander, the Persian Empire was effectively dismantled, marking the end of a historic era. For Alexander the Great, Gaugamela was not merely a victory, it was a defining moment of his military genius. Even today, military experts study Alexander's tactics, trying to grasp how he managed to outthink and outmaneuver a force that was much larger. But here's something that really makes you stop and think. Alexander wasn't a king who sent others to fight his battles. He was right there on the front lines, fighting alongside his men. That's what made his men follow him with such loyalty. Let's not forget that Alexander's genius wasn't limited to what happened on the battlefield. He knew that winning battles wasn't just about tactics, it was about logistics. Therefore, the victory at Gaugamelo was also the defining moment that solidified Alexander's place in history as one of the greatest military minds of all time. With the Persian Empire crumbling after the decisive battle of Gaugamela, it might seem like Alexander's journey had just reached its peak. But before he ever faced Darius, Alexander had already fought fiercely in the Balkans, securing his reign in Macedonia and stabilizing his empire's northern borders. His Balkan campaign was the proving ground for his leadership, shaping the tactics and strategy that would later win him Gaugamela. So, how did those earlier battles in the rugged Balkans prepare Alexander for his greatest conquests? And what can we learn from his unstoppable drive? Stay tuned as we explore the origins of his military genius. Be sure to subscribe and dive into the story of Alexander's Balkan campaign.